I'm Miss Mila Rose and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm getting into part two of my adult story time. I know it's been a while and you guys probably wanted that part two <laughs> that I promised and it's been a while because I couldn't really figure out how to really film part two and it really doesn't have like a really good flow like start to end of the first chunk of time there but I can't really move into anything else without getting into all of those details so I'm just gonna go ahead and sit down with you guys grab some snacks because this might be a while and give you guys those details so that you can actually put the pieces together when I'm going into the next story time because this is not going to be the last story time I did actually end up working as a call girl on and off for a couple of years and we're just getting started. I did two weeks, I moved over to Toronto, and I'm about to start working for a company that I'll be working with until I basically up and leave being a call girl altogether. So of course, as always, as a disclaimer, this is just my story. This is not any advice. This is not a how-to. This is not a guide. This is just my personal story of what I've experienced, that is absolutely it and nothing more than that. Obviously, I'm not going to be sharing any crazy personal information or private details of the company or websites or anything like that. I'm just going to get into my experiences and that's that. So with that all being said, let's get right into part two of this story time. So right off the bat, let's pick up where we left off and that was me moving from Vancouver back to my hometown of Toronto because I had just graduated from my 3 animation and modeling program. That was about a two and a half year. It was a two year program, but it took me a little bit longer because my student loan couldn't cover enough, so I had to extend my time there basically. So I'm back in Toronto. I'm actually living with my brother and his wife because I didn't plan on staying there long. I had planned, remember, to make that savings goal so that I could go and move to Guam and live there. And I have my reasons, and I'll get into those in a future story time, but that's not important right now, and it's just, it's too messy for me to disclose too much information. This is just my adult story time series. So just getting into my experiences surrounding the adult entertainment world as a call girl. So I'm living with my brother, and I'm living with my sister-in-law, and I already know that I do not want to be taking up more space than I have to because this is their place. I already had a very guilty conscience of living in other people's spaces because growing up in a very domestic, violence, abusive household, I ended up having to live with a couple of friends who were very supportive of me, their, their whole family were, and they actually took care of me financially as well, and that burdened them financially and that made me feel like an asshole and that I was taking, taking, taking and I couldn't give back because I had nothing to give and you know I didn't have an income source and I was still in high school. So right off the bat I'm already trying to do the most, go above and beyond. I'm doing their dishes, I'm cleaning their bathrooms, I'm sweeping and mopping their floors routinely and regularly. I clean up my space, I slept on the couch, I made sure that all the blankets and everything were folded in the morning. I lived out of a suitcase, everything was put in the suitcase and zipped up and closed before I left the door. I actually got a part-time job working in Mississauga, which is about a three hour commute from where my brother and his wife were living in Scarborough. So that was a six hour commute every time I had a work shift, which is about four days a week, and that's six hours of commute back and forth. I would leave early, I would get back late, usually about 1.30, 2 a.m. And I also had friends who I would hang out with when I wasn't working, and we would be up as late as 1.30, 2.30 a.m., and then I would be dropped off by my friend. Quickly, I realized that my life plans were quickly being disoriented and changing route because I had planned to jump country, just spend some extra time with my friends, and do something on the side before I left, but that turned out that that wasn't going to be the case, and I'll get into that another time. But basically, what I thought my life was going to be in the next month or two ended up not happening. So I right away started to look for a job in my field in 3D animation and modeling because I obviously needed to change route my whole life plan. So I was applying, I was doing interviews, none of it went smoothly and I realized quicker than not that it was going to be a very long time before I could actually find work in my field and that was just not going to be okay. I needed 
a quicker solution. I needed a temporary solution at the very least. I couldn't be waiting on getting a job for up to a year. I just couldn't. My sister-in-law was not having it and I didn't have the money to move out. Things were getting kind of tough. My sister-in-law was having sit down talks with me about my curfew and about, you know, I left like a couple dishes in the sink this one day that I didn't do right away. And I thought that was quite ridiculous because I do their dishes all the time. And for me to leave a, like a cup, a bowl and spoon in the, in the sink for one day until late, I didn't think that that was a big deal. And I thought that was just common courtesy that we're helping each other out here. Like I'm doing their dishes. If I leave a couple dishes, it shouldn't be that big of a deal. I'm getting out of your hair. So I'm getting back late because I'm working and I'm also seeing my friends, which you know, I'm getting back home at late, as late as 2 a.m. when I'm working. I don't see why it's such a bad thing that I'm getting at home as late as 2 a.m. when I'm with my friends. It's the same time, it's just personal versus professional. I don't know. It was weird. She didn't really have any common sense about around anything that she was saying. She was asking me for rent and curfews, and that didn't make sense because if I'm paying them rent, then that's shared space and I shouldn't have to have a curfew and I shouldn't have to be tied into these household chores, which I was already doing anyway. The whole thing was a mess. My sister-in-law was a complete dick, to be completely honest. My brother didn't have a problem with me living there, but my sister-in-law did and that was very made very, very clear to me. And that's why I was trying to get out of there as quickly as I could because I knew I wasn't welcome. Even though it wasn't directly set to my face, it was kind of, she went around that topic and kind of let me know in that other ways. So knowing that I didn't have any income to be moving out and getting my own place and it was going to be a while before I could get a job in my field, I decided to do the best thing I knew how at the time and that was to get another job as a call girl in Toronto. So I went on the website and I went, you know, put the keywords in, I found a listing, I went through the first page, I found a couple places, I signed up and one of the places I signed up to got back to me within an hour of the phone call. We did talk for a little bit. I went upstairs and outside to talk on the phone because I didn't want to be heard, obviously. And then we scheduled an interview, an in-person interview in downtown Toronto. I was going to commute to there and see them in person, figure out the details, get my photo shoot done, and get everything situated. So a little bit of a backstory on this company. It is female managed and female ran. The lady who started this company, that this company was hers and it was an out-call company at first. They didn't have like an in-call location. Then she started hiring drivers and she met this one out-call driver and she fell in love with him. He fell in love with her and they were sincerely, genuinely in, in love and they were together, you know, business partners and lovers from the entire time that I was working there. And, even before I worked there, I had heard how they hooked up. The male driver, who was her business partner now, was a very sweet guy, kind of laid back, but he tried to be um, strict, stern, and um, he was not really strict and stern, more as he was naggy. <laughs> like, you girls, you need to take your hair out of the drain. You girls, you need to make sure you're changing the sheets. You girls, make sure you do the bed. You girls, make sure when you are cooking and making food, you clean this mess up and they don't wanna see this. <laughs> so it was really funny. Like he wasn't, you know, rude, but he knew he had to be strict with the girls. He knew he had to be naggy enough to keep things clean. So I did say that they didn't have an in-call location. Now they had an in-call location. So when they got situated, they didn't. But when I started working for them, they had their first in-call location for running for a bit then. And it was a location in Brampton. The lady was very sweet, very docile, very professional, very hardworking. She's the one who did all the Photoshop edits for the girls' photos. So if they had like tattoos, she would take them out. She'd blur faces, that kind of thing. And she'd get the photos ready to be put on the ads. She also handled the phone and she worked seven days a week. There was no day off and the hours were very late. They were very early and they went very late. They could start as early as 10 a.m. and they could go as late as you wanted. So as late as it was busy, she was up on, on the phone and taking phone calls and managing all that stuff. She, the lady hardly slept. I don't know how she did it. Like I even told her a couple times, I don't know how you do it, you're crazy, um, but you're doing an amazing job. It's, insane. So honestly, the company was 
not sketch at all. Very well taken care of girls and ink collocations. They have a lot of ink collocations now. When I first started working, they only had the one. They also have, you know, phone bookers now that they pay and hire because they just can't micromanage everything without extra people taking phones. I think they end up having like two or three call ladies. Uh, but the turnaround rate was so high because it's such a difficult job to do. You would be shocked having to sit there and take calls when it's busy, like text and call and keep organized with managing every single girl. Like it ended up being a much bigger business basically than when I first went in. And it was really, really hard to keep it organized and maintained, but they did try their best and they did as good of a job as I think uh, anyone could have really done with the business. So I'm meeting them at an apartment in downtown Toronto. I took the bus over there. I met them for my interview. We sat down, I gave them my ID so that they can verify my age. And then we sat down and talked about how their company worked, the rates that they had both in-call and out-call and their in-call location. We talked about how my photo shoot would go, how we would drive over there and get my photos taken, get my ads situated, get all that information so they could do my ads. And then we can figure out a schedule for myself and that I would not be working the day of. Immediately I was kind of bummed because in the first place I was working in Vancouver, I had started working the first day. I already went home with a paycheck and that was great. But at this place, I knew right off the bat that I wasn't making any money by going there the first day, but I knew it was going to be worth it. So I just kind of sat there and like, okay, let, let's do this. And then I'll get my, my schedule situated so that I can get working and start making money. So it was a bit of a process from this apartment to the Brampton apartment because there was a lot of errands. And I mean, it's still quite a drive. It's still like uh, an hour-ish drive from there to Brampton straight, but there was a few errands that we had to do. I got there about 2 p.m. for the interview. I don't think we ended up getting to the in-call location until like 5.30 p.m. We ended up making a stop for food. They asked if I wanted anything. I said no because I had a photo shoot and I didn't want so much in there, you know? We also made a stop to the guy's vehicle, another vehicle, he had all of his photography equipment in there, so he wanted to move it into the vehicle we were driving so that we could take that to the in-call location. So on our way to the in-call location, we also stopped at Tim Hortons to get all the girls coffee. There were three girls working at the in-call location when we got there. They were all very excited to meet me and see me. I'm sure this didn't happen very often that there was a new girl working, at least not at the time. Now the turnover rate is crazy, at least from the time before I left the company. So there are three girls that were working at the in-call location when we got there. Two of the girls have been working there much longer, and one of those girls was more of like the dominant girl, and she had actually been doing like a lot of strip dancing out of other provinces, and she also does call girl things in the province that she was from. She wasn't from Ontario. And then there was the other girl, the third girl, she was actually much newer there. She'd only been there, I think, a few days. She did not get along with the more dominant girl that was out of province. They actually clashed a good bit and there was kind of like some drama there. So immediately when I first got there, I was like, oh great, this is like a drama, girl drama filled house. This is going to suck. I don't want to do in calls. So the company owners were in the main room situating the photography equipment, the white sheet and all the stands and the lights and everything that was taking a while to set up. So I was in one of the bedrooms with the girls and we were just chatting. I was asking about, you know, how the rates are because when I was working in Vancouver, the rates were higher. That's just because the cost of living in Vancouver is also much higher. So that kind of made sense. She said, no, like this company is great. You're going to love it here. The rates are great. There's nothing wrong with the rates here. They're actually very standard. And I was like, okay, well, cool, that's fine. You're clearly more experienced than I am. She had worked in Vancouver. She had worked in, I think, Edmonton or Calgary. She had worked in Ontario. I was just chatting with these girls. They're asking me about my experiences and what brought me into the industry and being a call girl. And I let them know, you know, I just worked for two weeks and now I'm here. So after all the photography equipment was set up, some of the girls actually wanted their pictures redone. So they went first. Um, I think it might have been my choice. I'm not sure that I opted to do it later. Uh, but it was very intimidating and awkward because the girls wanted to watch the other girls get photo photographed. And I, I'm weird because I'm okay with males seeing my body. 
completely okay, but I am not okay. I'm very, very, very uncomfortable and self-conscious about females seeing my body. I feel like, I think it's because I compare myself a lot and I always feel less than other girls, especially, you know, being underdeveloped up here. So uh, I always felt very intimidated, self-conscious, and I didn't like feeling there, there was a competition between physique with other women. So I'm much more uncomfortable being nude in front of other women versus other men. I mean, mind you, they were lingerie photo shoots. I was in bra and panties and stuff like that. So it wasn't, it wasn't like completely in the buff. So other girls are going first with some new photos for their ads. I was waiting on the sidelines intimidated and nervous for my turn because I knew that everyone was going to be watching me. If it was just the lady and the man, that would have been fine for me. I wouldn't have been too intimidated and uncomfortable, but the females, the other girls that were working there, that made me very uncomfortable and nervous. So eventually it was my turn and it started getting really late. It was like 7.30 before I even started getting my turn to do my photographs. And the lady who owned the business, she was like, you need lipstick. So she pulled out a lipstick from her purse and she gave it to me for me to apply it and then I, I had some lipstick on for the shoot because I didn't bring any makeup and it had been hours and you know, I showed up for the appointment at like two o'clock and it was already like an hour hour and a half commute for me to get there and then it was already like 7 30 o'clock when I started doing my photos so my makeup wasn't like fresh at that time and I didn't bring any with me because I had I didn't know that it was going to be so long but anyway I got my photos taken care of and then we sat down and they were taking my stats, hair color, eye color, your chest size, your waist size, what's your background? And then we got into the name and I asked them if I could have the name Mila because that was, you know, the company that I worked at before in Vancouver for two weeks. They gave me the name Mila. Unfortunately, there's another girl working there with a very close and similar name or exactly the same, I can't remember, but they wouldn't allow me to have the name. So I kind of sighed and I was bummed out and I, I was just like, I, I don't know what to name myself then. And then she kind of just chose a name for me and she's like, I like this name. and. Ugh, I hated, I hated the name so much. The name was Abigail. Um, gosh, I hated that name so much. It just sounded so cringy to me. I hated it, but I was like, okay, whatever. A name's a name, but you know, this is, this is going to be my job. I'm excited to work. I'm excited to make money. I'm excited to be moving out of my brother and my sister-in-law's place and get my own place. Essentially, it was my biggest thought process and goal in that moment. So I didn't really care about the name, even though I didn't like it. So then we got talking into schedules and all that stuff. I did say that I was going to be working at the in-call for the first couple of days I did. And when I was working at the in-call, it was just the new girl in me. And she liked that I was there because, you know, I kind of get along with everyone. I am easy to get along with. I don't cause fights. I don't cause drama. I'm pretty chill. So she kind of had found a friend with me in a way. She was also out of province from, I think, uh, Montreal. So she and I kind of clicked a little bit. I found her a little annoying because she was a little too clingy and always wanted to hang out and chat and socialize. And I was just like, yeah, okay. <laughs> just a little bit too much energy. I needed her to tone it down a bit. But she was sweet and friendly and nice. But you know, I, I could see how she and that other girl were not completely get on along that well. She did come off as a little snobby and privileged. Could be wrong, but that's a little bit of the vibes that I was picking up. When we were waiting for calls, you're we actually playing Maze Runner. Uh, she had Maze Runner on an iPad that she had. And she let me play it. So that was pretty fun. I did like the Maze Runner games, so that was cool. So my first couple shifts at this company were at the ink call. I didn't mind them, but again, I didn't enjoy working around other girls. Also at this time, this is not how the company worked long term. They did end up changing it, but at first when I started working there, they actually had the male just come on over and he got to choose which girl he wanted. And this was uncomfortable for, for the girls because one of us had to feel bad that we were chosen and the other girl had to feel bad that they weren't chosen and maybe they felt less than and the guy had to feel uncomfortable that he even had to choose like that's really uncomfortable for every party involved they they did stop doing this and everyone was very happy that they stopped doing this that that is how they, they ran it for a very long time or not a very long time kind of a short time but it still happened so i was kind of uncomfortable with the situation and i did 
completely swap over to working as alcohol only. So that means that I was literally with the driver 24 seven during my shift. And when we got a call, we would drive over there. He would drop me off. He would go somewhere nearby, wait for the shift to be over, pick me up. And then we would wait for the next call and go to the next call. And that's just how those shifts worked. But basically how I met my driver who ended up being my regular driver, I was actually watching a movie with my friends. She knew everything was going on. All my friends knew. I mean, I had like two close friends at the time. So they both knew what was going on. And they knew that I was also working uh, my two weeks too back in Vancouver. But we were at the mall and we were watching a movie and like 20 something minutes into the movie, my driver's like, I'm here. So I was like, okay, well I gotta slip out and, and go now, sorry. <laughs> like she knew that, That's that was the plan. So I went out, met my driver, uh, then we started, you know, just chatting up, introducing each other. And he was actually working for the company right when they started and they were looking for alcohol drivers. So he knew like everything that had went on. So I kind of got some insight over the time that I was working with this driver alongside this driver about the backstory of this company basically. And that's how I know so much. So to rewind a little bit and give you guys a bit of a time frame, I did finish up in Vancouver um, mid to late September and then I moved back to Toronto and then I started working uh, like late October or mid mid late October I think that's when I started working at this new in call location in Toronto and then doing out calls right after and I was working there all the way until the spring of the next year around March April is the first segment before I took a break during the entire time I did go back and forth between being an in call and an out call girl I mainly just did out calls but there were times where I went in to do in call shifts as well and during those times, I met some really cool girls. There was this one girl who was super, super sweet, super nice. She actually disclosed to me a lot of information about how she'd had a couple miscarriages and you know, how like her struggles in her life. And she would always bring in like a bottle of wine and she'd be like, hey Abigail, come have a drink with me. And this time, you guys, I didn't like really drink at all. I had drank in like a couple times in my life prior to this, I think, but that was about the extent of me drinking and I didn't like the taste of alcohol at all and I never really had wine before. But she actually got me into enjoying it and she's the reason why I like wine. I just, I have so much anxiety and then when I start drinking a little bit of a wine, it just slowly calms down my brain and I get to kind of chill out and I don't have to be so on hyperdrive mode all the time in my brain because it's just literally so loud in there at all times of the day and I drink coffee a lot and it doesn't help, it definitely amplifies it, but but anyway, I got into drinking wine from working as an in-call girl for a bit and that would have never happened if I didn't not meet this girl probably, so that's pretty cool and I did. She was really cool to hang out with, she was really sweet, she was really friendly. We did kind of hit her off as kind of friends for a bit, but she didn't stick around too long and I was doing alcohols a lot. so. It didn't completely last, but she was pretty cool. Doing alcohol work, I quickly realized that there's way more sketchy people in alcohols than in calls. A lot of people are doing cocaine, believe it or not. I mean, I've, I've had people who come into the in call and like, oh, can I do this at the in call? And um, I'm pretty sure I was already told by my company that they're not allowed. So I tell them already they're not allowed. There's a lot of cocaine in the, in the industry, basically. Um, people who hire the girls. And I also heard of a lot of girls who are actively working on it. Not at my company, from my understanding. I mean, there were girls who allegedly were on it, but they were like fired. That's not allowed at the in-call locations or for the out-calls girls to be on that stuff. That is a big no-no for a company or my past company. Of course, we're allowed to blacklist customers. We're allowed to say, we don't enjoy this customer. I don't want to see him anymore. But unless I seriously think that my, my safety is at risk, I like the hustle and you know, I'll kind of I'll kind of take whatever comes my way. So I did get these calls every now and then and they were weird, um, weird and interesting experiences. My last day before Christmas, I actually did an independent call because Christmas day was the only day of the year that this place is closed and every other day it was open, working, running from like 10 a.m. to whatever time people decided to stop calling in basically. So I met this one guy at a hotel, he was a British man and 
he was out of country and he was visiting on business purposes and I met him, he really enjoyed me. I think that he found me very, you know, the girl next door, easy going, open-minded, and he really enjoyed that. So he decided he really wanted to see me on Christmas, but I let him know, you know, Christmas, our company's closed, unfortunately. But at the same time, I was also hustling. Like I wanted to work on Christmas, but they were closed on Christmas, unfortunately. So he actually said, hey, give me your number and I'll have you come over and I'll pay you for your time and obviously you're gonna get like the full cut because otherwise the company would have gotten a cut. In my hustling state of mind, I decided, okay, I'll give you my phone number and we'll make this happen. So the next day, Christmas came and I went on the bus, the subway. I, I think I was wearing a dress and heels. And basically what I just told my brother, cause he was like, why are you so dressed up? But it was Christmas. So I was like, yeah, I'm gonna go with my friends. We're gonna go hang out. And you know, that's why I'm dressed up. So for, it wasn't too weird for me to be dressing up knowing that it was Christmas. But yeah, I, I went, I got on the bus, subway, whatever. I commuted all the way downtown. I had initially met the guy downtown at like a Harvey's or something. And then he went in with me and he asked if I wanted anything to eat. He got something to eat. And then we walked over to the hotel, we went up, we hung out, we had our session, and he had asked, you know, we should definitely do this again sometime. Um, I said, okay, sure. Uh, and he ended up being a little annoying because, I mean, he had my phone number, right? So he texted me actually quite often, and it ended up starting to weird me out a little bit more so that he had my personal information than anything else, like my phone number. So I ended up blocking his number over time and ignoring his messages and blocking him over time. Uh, he didn't He didn't book me through the company, he just wanted the private engagement, which I did learn later on that a lot of guys prefer to know that these are privately independent girls and that they're not you know, working for a company. And that's kind of a part of what my company disclosed to me too, is that if they ask you, you, you say you're independent, you don't say that you're working for a call center. It's just more of a fantasy, I guess, and maybe there's more of a stigma attached to it that, oh, like, are you, you know, being forced to do this against your will, or I don't know what goes on through men's head. I mean, this was a great company. I, I can't say anything bad about it. I mean, everyone has their struggles, and were they most organized at times? No. Were they a bit sloppy at times? Yes, but they were kind to their girls. They gave them second chances. They did their best around the business as best as they could, and they treated everyone fairly. But I do understand that letting the clientele know that we are independent rather than working for a company makes a lot of sense, and it just, it, it just was a better option to do that than to let them know that, yeah, this is the call center. So basically, we would just be like, yeah, we're roommates and we're independent. That was kind of what we would tell them. And it wasn't true, but it wasn't completely not true. I mean, at the same time we were independently working, we were just getting hits and advertisement from a bigger spectrum, you know, of an agency, as you will, but you know, it was ran by two people essentially. So that was the last time that I saw this particular man who had my phone number that I did an independent call girl uh, appointment meeting with and I never did one again. I just feel like that my safety is more compromised in that manner. So I, I was hustling on Christmas though, like I wanted something for Christmas, that's why I did it. So I ended up wrapping up with him and he kept on wanting to extend. He kept on not wanting to end our session. We were, we were going over time. I think that was like part of it too. It was like he was kind of a little abusive to the whole situation that he knew that I didn't have anyone keeping tabs on me so he could get away with more time for less money. So I think that was a big reason too. I was like, yeah, never again. But anyway, I wrapped up my session. I did get paid uh, again, less than I should have with the amount of time I spent with him. But I headed back to the bus, went back on the subway and you guys, the most interesting thing happened. Um, so like out of romance movies, but I mean, it wasn't like the craziest experience, but my friends thought it was kind of crazy. So basically I'm, you know, I'm all dialed up. I'm in a cocktail dress. I'm wearing heels, 
I'm sitting on the subway, hair and makeup's done up, and there's this guy who is on the subway, and I, I just hear him snickering to himself and like scribbling on this piece of paper, and I just thought it was weird, but it was, I just, I thought he was like kind of attractive though. So I saw him get up and stand up and I was like, oh yes, he's getting off at this stop here. So he was getting up to go past me to get off on his stop. And he like kind of waved me down. He didn't say a word, not a word came out of his mouth. Kind of just smiled and waved at me, had a piece of paper in his hand. And he said, he pointed to it and he handed it to me. So I took it and I kind of just smiled and I was confused and then he got off at his stop and I looked at the paper, it was like a, a lottery ticket paper I think, um, and then it had his phone number <laughs> with something like a message like call me or, t or text me smiley face or something like that and he was like pretty attractive to me anyway so I was like um, Maybe I will, should I? So immediately after this interaction, I had to text my friends. I mean, I had to wait till I got signal because I was on the subway, unfortunately, but I had to text one of my friends and I was like, hey, this just happened to me. And she's like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. It's just like out of a romance movie. You have to text him, you have to call him, you have to. Like, she was making me do this, guys. So I was like, okay, chill, I will. I'll text him, I'll message him, I'll see where this goes. And I did. But that's also another story for another time because it's not really part of the adult entertainment story. That's where I'm gonna leave you guys off. I do stay working here and I don't take my first long-term break until the spring, like March, April-ish. I think it was March-ish. But I'm gonna leave you guys there and I'm gonna pick up the story another time. I do wanna get back into my real life story times. I wanna try and catch up with my real life story times to this point before I continue on more adult story times so that you can put everything together and you can come along with me on this adventure knowing way more information and being way more in the loop and in the know so that everything makes a lot more sense because otherwise things are just gonna get way too confusing. I mean, they already kind of are, you're like, where are you gonna go? Why were you gonna go? And now, why are you taking a break in spring and all this stuff? Like, it all comes together. I just, there is information that needs to be disclosed. That's it, you guys, and I'm gonna get there, and I want to. Um, the biggest thing with my story times of my life is I have this rule that I don't want to tell a story, like the next chapter, if I'm thinking about it before I say it, like I will literally sit down and think about, okay, the next chapter is going to be this. I'm gonna break it down kind of like this. If I at any moment like break down while thinking about the story that I'm gonna be telling, I have a rule of myself that I will not tell the story if it's too hard for me to talk about. And my story does get very, very hard to talk about, at least from the time that I'm starting to get into because domestic violence starts getting a lot worse. It leads me to leaving my house and honestly that's like the whole chunk that's the most sensitive to talk about. If I can get over that hurdle you guys, I'm good to talk about the rest of my story but that hurdle is where I'm struggling right now. The next chapter should be coming out relatively soon with my story time because that one is just more like me being rebellious and that kind of thing. and. It's nothing too crazy until the following chapter when things just become a mess with my house and my household. But that's where we're going to leave it with you guys today. I hope this story was interesting and entertaining for you guys. I'm obviously doing this for entertainment purposes only. I am sharing my experiences. I'm sharing my story. Um, take with it what you want. If it's interesting to you, if it's fascinating to you, if you just want that drama, that tea, there's drama and tea coming in the story time, more so with the call girls, literally, than anything else, but you might be fascinated about the whole world of being a call girl in general. If that's the case, then maybe you want to stick around and watch the rest of the episodes of the story. I'm probably not going to make another one for a while because I do want to focus on my story time series of just my life before all of this. And with that all being said, I would very much appreciate a big thumbs up, subscribing to my YouTube channel, and turning on those notifications on down below. And I'll see you guys with another video. Bye for now.